Well, this morning, we're going to look at Christmas through the eyes of the aged Saint Simeon. Uh, We don't really know his exact age, but most commentators agree that he was advanced in years, that he's waiting to die, and he won't die until he sees the Lord's Christ. So, uh, most likely he was, he was older and, and getting close to even to, to death. So I'm going to throw him in maybe the 70s, 80s around there, but we don't know for certain. So I realize it's been 10 years since I preached on my favorite passage of Scripture uh, for Christmas. And so uh, I chose this, and then I found out Nate Thompson chose it as well. Is that what you're still going with? Good. So you guys get Simeon all day long. There's just something that... When the Lord's speaking and moving, that's the kind of stuff He does. So I I pray I don't say anything that you're going to say tonight. But if you would, turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And as you're finding your way there, I just kind of want to set the context of this passage. It's really a beautiful context. Is that Luke is composing this gospel, he says, for a man named Theophilus. And he's showing the, the life and the death of Jesus and its significance. And he's gone and he said he's made careful search and inquiry to go to eyewitnesses and do interviews and gather all this information. And the great physician has put together the gospel that we have before us this morning called the gospel of Luke. And as he begins with the birth of Christ in this gospel, Luke now is calling witnesses into the courtroom to testify who is this baby that was born in Bethlehem. Uh, this, this, just, this did not just happen in a vacuum that one day the Son of God was born into the world. It has been thousands of years that there have been prophecies throughout the Old Testament and types and pictures of the one that God said He would send into the world to save it back when Adam sinned and took the whole race with him. So this has been something that God has been working out through all of history, and it's been being painted and told about in the Old Testament, and now finally in the fullness of times, Jesus Christ has entered into the world. So Israel has been waiting and hoping for this Messiah to come to earth for thousands and thousands of years. It has been their hope, and many of them as they were dying, they kept passing on this hope to the next generation, you know, here's what's coming, here's what God has promised. The righteous, they were waiting and they were hoping for this day when He would finally come, thousands of years waiting. And now Luke opens his gospel and he shows the fullness of the times. Uh, Michael Card wrote a song called The Final Word, and he says, eternity stepped into time. So the eternal one, God himself, entered into time, the created space, and he came into the world he made. And he came in the form of a baby, and he was born into a manger. And he was fully God and fully man, and he came to bring men and God back together where they could have a relationship that was destroyed in Adam. And so the first witness that Luke calls into the courtroom is he calls the parents in. And they come and they name him Jesus as they had been told, which means Jehovah saves. This is God. This is what God has given to save the world. Then he calls in Simeon, who we will look at this morning. Then Anna will testify of this baby. And then in chapter uh, 3, God himself will say, this is my son and who I am well pleased. And so everyone is testifying and saying, this is indeed the promised one, the Messiah, the one that God has been telling us he would send. He's come. It's happened. This is it. This is what you've been waiting for. Here's the climax of history thus far. So this morning, we're going to call our second witness then to the stand. And would the aged godly man, Simeon, please come and testify of who it was that was born That morning. So if you'll look with me in Luke 2 25 is where we'll begin this morning. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And so we know very little about this man up until now. And when, again, I'm assuming he's an old man. He's named after one of Jacob's sons. Simeon, the the word means God has heard. And I think it was a very fitting name as he was praying and he's longing for the coming of the sunrise from on high to visit and come and bring healing in his wings for the nations. And so he uh, has heard now, God has heard the cry of my heart and my prayers for this one. 
I think one of the things that Luke wants us to get then from this man was his character. And he begins there in verse 25, and he says that he was righteous and devout. So he was a man who was seeking God, he was living for God, he was devoted to God, and he was waiting and hoping for the consolation of Israel. He had his eyes fixed on what God had promised throughout the ages. And so it's been a long time. I want you to understand when Luke writes this, there's been a silence in any kind of prophet writing or testimony, miracle. They've seen nothing for 400 years. America hasn't been in existence as a country for 400 years. So picture the whole history of our country. You've heard nothing from God. You've seen no prophets come on the scene. All you have is this old, old promise. And now all of a sudden, God is going to start speaking and virgins start conceiving babies. They, 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 they're, it didn't dim Simeon's hope with the silence of revelation for 400 years. He still trusted in God. He was still looking for what God had promised. Their, their hope was not drying up. He was looking for the Greek word God's manichim, which is God's consolation to Israel. And so this, this word means comforter. Or this word means Messiah, God's promised Messiah, his Savior, the one who would come and redeem a people. And so Simeon's looking for that. So what did the Spirit tell Simeon? I want you to look with me in verse 26. And it had been revealed to him by who? By the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Simeon, you are not going to die until you see the promise that I have made and been saying that I would send to the world. Could you imagine the joy of this aged man all of a sudden, 400 years, and, and you're not going to die until you see the one that I've been promising. And so now there comes a day now when promise is going to meet fulfillment. And that's the day in our text that we're looking at. As I, I just can't overemphasize the beauty of what's going on here in the history of the world. Eternity has come into time and now promise is meeting the fulfillment. And look with me then in verse 27. In verse 27, so Simeon then, he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law. And so the Spirit led Simeon uh, to the child named Jesus, and he walks into the temple, and he takes this baby, and he takes him into his arms, and he's now holding God's mannequin. He's now holding the comfort that was promised the Messiah. Simeon takes him up in his arms, and he had been waiting for so long, and here he is. Now he holds what has been promised of God for these thousand years. This is the history of this whole nation. This whole nation, their history has been built upon this promise, and now Simeon is holding the Savior of the world in his arms. And he did what we all should do. It says he worshiped God. That is the only response to God's Messiah. God sending his own son into the world to redeem it. The only response is to become a worshiper of a God who would do something like this. And look what he said in verse 28. So he takes him in his arms and he blesses God. And he said this, Now, Lord, thou dost let thy bondservant depart in peace. According to thy word, let me go now in peace. I can die in peace. Why? For my eyes have seen thy salvation. In the Greek, it's, it's a definite article, which means the salvation. This is the salvation that has been promised and prophesied. Let me die in peace now because my eyes are looking at the salvation. I'm looking at what you have promised this is what you've been saying. This is what God has done. The object that I am holding, I like the Greek word, it says this is God's soterion. It's where we get the word soteriology, which means the study of salvation. I'm holding God's soterion. This is what God promised to bring about a salvation to this world. I'm holding this in my arms, the promise, the fulfillment, the soterion of God. Simeon is looking at Jesus now by faith, and he's, he's not looking at the temple. His hope is no longer, it's not in a temple. 
He's not looking at all the sacrifices that are going on in that temple. He's not looking at the ark that had the tablets of stone to, to, with the Ten Commandments. He, he, he's not looking at his own strength. He's gazing at a little baby. And he's gazing at this little baby, which is God's salvation. And he says there's salvation nowhere else. This is the salvation. You can't find it any other place. There's no other name under heaven which God has given that a man may be saved. This was God's answer to man's problem. Here's my answer, the soterion. And he's holding it and he looks nowhere else but to this child. He alone is salvation. This is what God has provided. There is nowhere else that you will ever find salvation. This is God's gift to the world. He loved it so much that he gave his only begotten son. This is his soterion. This is his mannequin. This is his comfort. This is God's saving one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I pray that all in this room would come then and behold him. I pray that there would be none that would miss out on the salvation that God provided to this world. God gave salvation. And I don't want anyone to walk out of here this morning without this gift. This is what Christmas is. God gave us the gift that would be salvation. Look with me in verse 31. He is prepared in the presence of all peoples. And so this one will be a light of revelation to the Gentiles. He will open our eyes to salvation. And all the nations now will know of this gospel. And he'll be the glory of thy people Israel, he'll be what you've been waiting and looking and longing and hoping for. This is the glory of what has been promised. And after all of this, look at Mary and Joseph's response in verse 33. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. They're, they're amazed. They, you know, they, they've seen angels. Mary had an angel come and tell her she's pregnant. You're going to have the Son of God. She conceives by the Holy Spirit. She has shepherds come and tell her of the amazing things that they have seen. And now she comes and Simeon says this, and she is amazed. With each revelation of Christ, they just keep sitting there being amazed at what God is doing. And I ask you this morning, are you amazed? Are you amazed? Do these things hold joy and delight in your hearts? Are you amazed at what we're looking at? this morning. So what I would like to do, that's introduction, and if you're visiting, I'm known for long introductions. I'm sorry. Uh, I want you now just to sit back, because it has been so busy, and, and I just want you to look, and I want you to look at what Simeon was holding that morning, afternoon, evening. I don't know when for sure, but I want you just to look at Jesus. So we're going to have a simple outline, just four ways that we're to look at Christ. So just look this morning. Luke shows us four ways to look at Christ. So I want to look first. Take, take a lone look at Jesus. Take a singular look at Jesus. Take a steady look this morning at the Messiah. Most this Christmas will not do this. Most have busy lives and they're just trying to survive, and they don't take downtime to be still and know that He's God, and they won't slow down and just look. They'll sing hymns, and they'll write cards, and have parties, and gifts, and have t-shirts that say, Jesus is the reason for the season, and they won't stop and take time to even look at Him. He was the focus of everything that Christmas morning. Simeon, everything now is lesser. Nothing else matters but this baby that he's holding in his hands. Uh, Zacharias is, is now worshiping. Elizabeth is worshiping. Mary, the angels, all this is about is Jesus Christ. You look at Luke 1 and 2, and there's this diamond that everybody is looking at and singing praises and worshiping. It's Jesus Christ. The Magi and Anna, they're going to all keep coming, and the focus of all of them is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the focus of all of Revelation. He says, everything that was written has pointed to me. He's the focus of all the apostolic preaching. We preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 
He's the focus of heaven where they adore and worship the, the, the uh, uh, crucified Christ for eternity. He's the focus of the last day. When he comes, all will see him. There is nothing more important than a steady look at Christ. Look at Christ. In him, there's no sin or defect. There's no darkness. There's no stain. There's no fickleness in his love that goes up and down. There's glory and there's excellence. Look at Christ. He's full of grace and truth. He's full of forgiveness of sins. He's full of eternal life. He's called the eternal life, and I give that to all who come to me. And so this morning, I'm asking that you would be like Simeon, and you would look blinded to all rival attractions. Everything that's been gaining your vision in your heart, just this morning, let nothing else be there. This is not window shopping. This is Christ is ours by faith, and he wants us to take a lone look at him this morning. Look at nothing else but Christ. Give your eyes, look this morning, a lone look, a singular look at the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's another kind of look that I want to ask you to take as well this morning, is I want you to take a spiritual look at Jesus, because many are going to look at Jesus this season and he'll do their souls no good at all. You might be sitting here this morning uh, looking at Jesus, and he will do your soul no good at all. It, it, uh, that's not sufficient just to look. You need to look at Jesus spiritually. Three times in this text this morning, he says the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit led Simeon. The Holy Spirit led Anna. And so Jesus, I want you to catch this, I was raised differently. He didn't have a halo around his head where everyone was like, whoa, and the lights are shining in on him. No, no angels were even singing above him. There's this little six-week-old baby that was brought into a temple, and he looked like every other baby that morning. Nothing different or impressive to look at him. He's just another baby as parents are making the sacrifices for the firstborn children. And now Simeon comes and he walks in there and he takes this one and he begins blessing God for him being his salvation. How did he do that? How did Simeon not, how did he know that? God has revealed to him by his spirit who this one really is. And so I can tell you this, you can read the gospels from now until Jesus returns and you will never be able to see who this one really is. You can know all the stories and smile and read them to your children this Christmas and never look savingly at Jesus Christ. I sang Christmas hymns for 20 years every Christmas, and I knew nothing of his glory. I was a lost, estranged sinner singing away in a manger in joy to the world that I had none in my heart or nothing. You can look at this Jesus and not be saved. You need to see him spiritually. I understood nothing of the character and the work of Jesus Christ that Simeon saw that day. And so I asked this morning that you would take a spiritual look at Jesus. I want you to go beyond the externals of the facts and the songs and all the presents and the hoopla. He was not just a good man. Please don't miss that. He was not just a good teacher. Jesus was more than an example. He didn't come to be an example. He was a redeemer. He came and he went into death for me. And he died on a cross so the justice of God could be satisfied for my sin. And he died to ransom me from the bondage of my sin and death. And that the devil held over me in, in absolute control and dominion. He came to break that bondage. And he came to be a ransom to set me free and redeem me to God. And so religion is what you have to do to save yourself. And you keep trying to do things to get yourself saved. But the gospel is what he has done for you. And that's what Simeon was holding. The one who would do everything to bring about salvation. And I need to be able to look at Christ and see that it is finished. Everything that I need for my salvation is in that Son of God. Simeon takes a spiritual look, and he sees the glory of God in that little baby. And he says, this is my salvation. Let me depart in peace. 
because now I've seen thy salvation. Unless you see what Simeon sees, then you still do not see. This is not just happy thoughts today. This is the ark of salvation that came into the world to rescue sinners. He alone is what Simeon looked at for salvation. He looked to nothing else but what God had provided in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'll ask you this morning, have you seen this? Have you seen this with spiritual eyes? Have you seen the glory of God in the face of Christ? He is all that your soul needs this morning. Christ alone is a Savior. He is name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Have you looked at Christ alone with spiritual eyes to save you from your sin? And so I ask that you would look your eyes out this morning at this baby who was a Savior of the world until you could say, even my sins were forgiven. Let me depart in peace because I've beheld your salvation. So I want you to take a lone look at Jesus Christ instead of all the things that are fighting for our attention this morning. And I want you to take a spiritual look and I want you to see what really was born in that manger that morning. And thirdly, this is my, I, I think my most important point I want for everyone here this morning is I want you to take a serious look at Jesus. Okay, I, I don't want you to play at this. Your eternity is at stake. So I want you now to take a very serious look at Jesus. Because Simeon had some private words for Mary. I want you to listen to what he says in verse 34. Simeon blessed them and he said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed and a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. <laughs> kind of shocking. <laughs> Wait a minute, Simeon, I like fulfillment, I like your salvation, I like joy to the world. What is this? What are you talking about? This is the first thing negative that's been mentioned thus far. Why does something always have to be negative? Isn't the world just so negative? I want a positive message, Pastor. I came in here, I got my ham ready and everything and presents, and I don't want negative. I came for positive Christians are just wet blankets at every party. And that, there's some truth to that. We're, we're just a bunch of wet blankets. But Jesus is going to be a wet blanket this morning, and he's going to, but this is a loving blanket. This is Jesus pressing for something very, very important. So this is not to ruin you. This is to make you. This is not to make you miserable. This is to give you joy. This is that you could enter in with the angels and sing joy to the world. So I'm telling you, I am not trying to make you miserable. I'm trying to bless you with the soterion this morning. But this truth has to be dealt with. And so as glorious as these things are about your baby, Mary and Joseph, this baby will also be appointed for the fall and the rise of many. And so I want you to hear this this morning. Though he is salvation, he's comfort and he's light and he's glory, uh, not all will embrace him. That's what he's telling him as a baby. Not everyone is going to embrace Soterion. Not everyone will. This should be the nation's greatest news and joys. This should be going from the rooftop everywhere. The creator of the world has come in to save sinners. You would think all the nations would be just exalting and, and praising and singing joy to the world. He should be embraced. This is what God has done to save us. What are you talking about, Simeon? Well, I want you to hear what Jesus Christ said when he grew up from being a baby in Luke 12 later in this book. He said this, do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but, but rather division. Jesus Christ is saying this, for now, from now on, five members in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. What is he talking about? Jesus is saying that this is going to bring division into homes. This isn't going to just bring this happy little slappy thing in every home, in every church, in every house. He's saying this one will bring about division. Christ will be a dividing line between mankind. He'll be the point of demarcation. 
many are going to come and stumble and actually fall over him. They're going to stumble over this rock. And John tells us that his own didn't even receive him. So when he came into the world, his own rejected him. They stumbled over Christ. And not only that, he says he's assigned to be opposed. The Greek word means resisted. So this one who was born to be salvation is going to be resisted by many. He's, he's saying that as he's a baby. And so they will stumble. They'll hate him. And so how can, how can that be? How could God send his son into the world to save it? And, and God gave his beloved son to this world. How do you hate that? How, how could anyone hate a God like that? Well, because he was going to come and he's going to manifest God. And he's going to manifest what is true righteousness and what is true sonship. He will come and he'll show what it really looks like. And when mankind hears that they are not righteous, they can't do anything to save themselves. They can't bring anything into this equation. When mankind hears this, that they are dependent upon this gift and this gift alone called the grace of God, they gnash their teeth and they hate it and they will resist him. They will resist him because you can't tell me I'm weak and I can't morally clean myself up and I can't get the wrath of God off me. I hate this message. I'm, don't you know? I'm the man. You can't say something like that. They're going to resist you. And I've said this before, man will do anything except nothing to have this gift of salvation. And that's what God says you must bring to this, is an empty hand with nothing in it. And simply look to Christ alone that God has given for salvation. And so Jesus is a sign of God's salvation and mercy. And he will proclaim, I am God's saving one. I've come endowed with salvation, and they're going to want to throw rocks at him. And they're going to cry for his blood, and they're going to say, crucify him. Guys, he will be opposed, but not if we make him a warm and moral guy. Accepting of everybody and non-judgmental. That's what our whole society is doing. That's where they've moved this gospel, and that might be doing what you're doing this very morning in your own heart. But if you set him forth as he truly is, that he alone is God's soterion, and that you're bankrupt to do anything to commend yourself to God, and apart from him, Jesus said, you can do nothing. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Men will hate him, and they'll hate you for that message. Christ is going to cause conflict. It was promised and prophesied. But what about the song, Peace on Earth? That's the peace that Simeon has, and that's the peace that I'm trying to lead you to this morning if you do not have it. Jesus comes and he says this. Simeon says, Jesus is going to be a great divider, and he's going to divide people. There's going to be conflict between people, and he's going to divide hearts. You'll have a conflict within your very heart. And so I just want to look at those two things, and we'll close out. Is he's going to bring conflict between people. In verse 34, uh, he said, Behold, this child's appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, a sign to be opposed. He's going to cause you to rise or fall. There's no in-between. He, he, he's going to be divisive. And the reason being is there's, there's a repulsiveness to his claims and why people will come. There's an attractiveness to his life in person. And so the repulsiveness of his claims is he comes and he says, I'm the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. I'm the ruler of all. I have all dominion. I own you. You belong to me, and you can't stay neutral in that statement. You need to crown me or kill me. you you got to surrender to me, or you're going to have to hate me and reject me and get me out of your conscience, get me out of your life. you got to deal with me. And there are many who want to just stay in the middle. As a pastor, I just see it all the time. I admire Jesus. I love his ethics. I love his morality. I'm just a good guy. And I love staying right there in the middle. But in this text, on the last day, whether it will be peace for you or eternal torment will be determined by what you do with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's get to the point. Luke, Jesus Christ, the rich young ruler, comes up and says, what must I do to be saved? Keep all the, the laws. And he gives the Ten Commandments. He skips one, don't covet. And the rich young ruler says, I've kept all of these. 
And Jesus said, go sell all that you have and give it to the poor and then follow me. And it says he went away sad because you're not saved by selling your riches. But he knew this man's heart and he said, you're going to have to give up everything to follow after me. And he went away sad. You have to love me more than your wealth. He says, if your eye keeps you from me, pluck it out. He says, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow after me. You're going to have to die to yourself if you want to follow after me. He demands our faith and our life and our love that he would be the supreme object. He either repulses you with these claims or you will embrace him. And we can't lessen them. Please hear this and pick the ones that we like. There's certain things I, I want to pick about Jesus. No, that is the sword this morning. What is it doing to your very heart right now? Are you wanting to throw something at me? What are you feeling right now? Are you looking and saying, oh, that's so Tyrion. I'll give up anything that I might have it. There's a beauty to this Christ. I, I want him over anything. All to Jesus, I surrender. Are you sitting here saying, who is this loser who would sit and say, I'm not God and I have to surrender everything to this Christ, my money, my hopes, my dreams, my life? Who is this guy? And it's going to divide. And there could be some hearts right now being divided by this Jesus Christ. And so his claims will bring about division. But why would anyone then come to him? That's the second part is there's an attractiveness to his life. Do you know that many teachers claim to be Messiah or God even in Jesus' time? Throughout history, they keep growing and coming. I'm the Messiah. And you know what happens? They get a little small group and they all fall away. But Jesus Christ now has millions and millions all over the world following and worshiping him. How did he do it? How could he be different than anyone else who claimed to be God? Because there was a moral beauty to him like no one else. He manifested God by the miracles, the way he lived, the way he spoke, and the way he loved. No one could claim what he claimed about himself, that he was God. He demanded adoration, and yet he was humble, and he was tender, and he loved the, the harlots and, and the tax collectors, and he, he, he had a sweetness to him that was so attractive as he does this day. There is no one like Christ. What could have made the monotheistic Jews surrender their lives and worship him the rest of their days? What well, was the beauty of Jesus Christ? And Jesus will make you rise or fall. You will either see his beauty as Simeon did, let me depart in peace, or you'll embrace him and all of his claims on your life. Take my life, God, it's yours. Or you'll hate him. There's no in between. You can't straddle the fence and make up a God that you want and pick the parts that you like. I like Christmas. That's, that's a cute little story. I like that. You can't divide this up. And this Jesus Christ, when he's preached in truth, will be a divider. Well, if Simeon is right, why do so many not hate Christ then? Why did he say many are going to rep be repulsed by him? Why? Why do so many, especially this time of year, like the little cuddly baby in a manger? Why do churches explode at Christmas, except this one? <laughs> Why so few? Why so few are truly surrendered to Him? Because here's it, is most people are neither. What I've been watching growing in our country is most people are moderate. Most people just like to live right in the middle. And the answer then is that Jesus is a fabrication. He, he, he's made up. He's, I remember when I took a, a little gal, a little sweet gal to build a bear. Um, and when you go in there, this is amazing. You get to pick all these little pieces that you want. I mean, you even get to pick, if you squeeze his tummy, what tune comes out or what he says. And just go in there and like, okay, I like this. I'm going to build a bear. And some of you have done that with Jesus. I like this. Oh, I, I like this part. I, and you just have built your little Jesus like a Build-A-Bear, and you've got him now what you like and how he fits your life and how you can control him and use him for what you want. That's really what has happened in our day. So is your Jesus a Build-A-Bear? Simeon tells us he allows no in-between. And so the question is, do you love Christ? Is he your only hope? Have you surrendered all to him? Have you truly come to him? 
Or as you sit here this morning, do you hate him? Do you hate his rule in your life? If you're in the, me- in the middle, then you, the Jesus that you believe in is a fantasy. They're, they're just that, that's, a, that's a make-believe Jesus. That is not the one that's revealed in Scripture. It's an idol. You, you made up a God that fits what you wanted. You made him just like you and how you want him. And I want to tell you, that'll never bring peace. That, that made-up Jesus will never bring you peace. So what is coming out this morning? The true revelation of Christ and his words, they, they demand a response. And, and what Simeon and Jesus have said, there's only two responses. You need to accept God's soterion. And you need to surrender to him as the only way of salvation. That is the only response that will get you eternal life. And the other is you, you're going to reject him. And your rejection can be cloaked in morality. I'm just a good guy. I've, I've, the little guys that ring the bells, I put five bucks in there. I've sent presents to kids in other countries. I'm just a good guy. And you can cloak yourself in morality, and morality is rejecting Jesus Christ. You can reject him with just nice thoughts and pleasantries. You can enjoy the stories about Jesus. I like all those stories when I was a kid growing up. I can sing songs that remind me of my childhood. I can light candles and do all of these things. And, and that can be rejecting Jesus because of your morality. And so the, 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 the driving, dividing line this morning is what are you going to do with what God gave to this world? He is salvation. And am I going to accept and surrender and believe and look to this alone Or am I going to keep looking to myself and what I want Jesus to be and what I want my life to be? Because this one will never bring peace with God. It'll never get peace into your own heart. And this one will bring you peace with God and peace in your heart and peace with other people. So what you do with Jesus Christ will affect all of eternity. That is the question this morning. What have you done with the Lord's salvation. So what I'm asking is I want you to take a serious look this morning. Take a serious look. What has this Christ done in your heart? Have you dealt with the real Jesus that's revealed in this scripture or have you built a bear? It needs to be answered before God who knows your heart better than you do. It says your secret sins are done in the light of his presence. There's no, this is the God who knows and you need to answer that question before the God who knows. And the fourth look I want to close with is you need to take a a singular look at Christ. You you need to take a spiritual look, and then you you need to take a serious look. And I want to just close with take a saving look, is I want you to have a Merry Christmas. I want you to be as blessed as a man or woman or child could possibly be. I, I want you to take a saving look this morning. What Simeon did is he took that baby in his arms and he received Christ. He embraced him as Savior as he held him. It's faith that receives the Redeemer. He is not just recognized, but he is embraced with your whole soul. Your whole being embraces him. He is the divinely sent Savior from my sin. By a saving look at Jesus, you'll be saved. And all he says is, I just want you to look. Look upon me and be saved. Look at me in the way that we have just seen and be saved. In John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And so my desire is that every eye would look and see what Simeon saw that day and that you would receive the indescribable gift of eternal life in God's soterion. Simeon held him in his arms as he leaned on the everlasting arms and he fell into the redeeming arms of Jesus Christ that day. And so what you need to do this morning then is look at a cross because this baby lived a life that was a perfect life. And he lived a perfect life so that God could now give that to you 
So it's not you going and living a perfect life. Jesus lived a perfect life, and, and by faith, He will give you that. And then there's consequences for sin. God said the soul that sins must die. Your sin has to be punished. It has to have a consequence or God is not holy and just. And so God took this baby, He gave it to the world, and He put it up on a cross. And He put the sins of His people on that child. And He pulled out the sword of justice, and He didn't spare His own son. He poured it out upon His own son, the wrath of God for sin, so that now you could be forgiven of all of your sins. Would you look at Jesus? Look at Him. God gave Him to be your salvation. Look nowhere else. Look at nothing else. And look only to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you'll have a merry, merry Christmas. And you'll have a merry, merry life. And you'll have a merry, merry eternal life. To God be the glory for salvation in Christ alone. If you uh, want to talk afterwards, I'm going to be up front, and I want you to have a, a merry, merry Christmas by having peace with God. God gave you soterion. Don't reject it. Let's pray. Father, I pray that no soul would hide in their morality this morning. I pray that you have pulled back the curtain of cleanness, of the funness of Christmas, all the songs and the garb that goes with it. I pray that you have pulled it back and that every soul in this room now knows that they need a salvation. You would have never sent a Savior into the world if we could have done it ourselves. You would have never killed your own son if we could uh, work ourselves into your presence. And so God, we worship you this morning because you are the one who has given us salvation. And you have given us your son and there is salvation in no one else. God, let every heart receive him Prepare him room. God, let every heart come now and adore him. Come, let us behold him. I pray that you would grant salvation to every soul in this room so they could have the merriest of Christmases. God, may this be their first one where their eyes actually behold and see the glory of God and the face of Christ as a Savior. Lord, we thank you for Simeon and what you recorded through Luke that blessed morning. And God, now we can depart in peace. We can die and be at perfect peace because we will be brought into your presence for all of eternity. God, give that peace to every soul here this morning. We praise you. Blessed be the name of our God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.